I made these pieces of animation last week and they have sparked some interest in the community. There's one thing they have in common. 3D text animated and deformed in harmonic motion with slight offsets in time. They are procedural projects, so you could make changes to the text or motion and get new results every time. I have to mention also that the animation loops no matter the scene length. These projects are meant as a demo of what is possible. Geometry Nodes offers great support for 3D typography work, albeit some features are hidden or not well documented. My intention with this tutorial is to show you the right way to generate and animate 3D text. Using the Extrude tool isn't enough. It doesn't have the option to add subdivisions to the new generated faces, and those divisions are trivial for smooth deformations. Invoking the repeat zone can work, but it may result too slow. I'll show you a better way, one that uses built-in nodes that have been in geometry nodes since the beginning. All my pieces play in real time, that means the method is fast. Not only will you learn to generate 3D text with the right topology, but also take full control of your letters transformations. I'll show you a modular system to animate, which you can apply separately to scale, rotation or position, each with slightly different settings for a more organic looking animation. There's plenty of useful takeaway concepts in this video, which you can apply to your other projects. I could easily tell you to use this node here and enter that value there, but my intention is to make you understand how something works and explain my reasoning for the choices I make. Hope you find it useful, and if so, tell me what you think of it. Type Motion Design into the text field of a String to Curves node. To have each word in a separate line, use the text box width value. Set it to a tiny amount like 0.01. Since the default character size is 1, there is no way that an entire word is smaller than this value. So each time you enter a space, the next word gets to go into its own line. Align the text block to the center. Right now, these are just instances of curves. We cannot render them. To do so, we have to add depth to them. The first option that comes to mind is the extrude node, but it doesn't operate on curves so we use the Fill Curve node first. Now the Extrude node has polygon faces to work on. All fine and good, but as with every tool, the Extrude has its weaknesses too. It doesn't let you add subdivisions to the new generated faces. Of course, Blender now has the option to apply the Extrusion several times, inserting it in a repeat zone, but I'll show you an alternative way, a better one with more options. Delete both Extrude and Field Curve nodes. The trick is to use the Curve to Mesh node instead. It does exactly what it says, generates a mesh or grid of polygons from two input curves. Main benefit for doing it this way is that you can resample a curve, thus adding subdivisions along the extruded faces. You may have tried to do it this way, but chances are you've been doing it wrong. Connect a curve line in the profile input. What you see straight away is not what you were expecting, I'm sure. This is not a bug. There's a reason behind this mess. The node uses the tangent direction of the text curves to extend the z-axis of the profile line. The x-axis, on the other hand, extends it in the normal direction along those curves, and the y extrudes along the cross product of tangent and normal, or perpendicular to them. As it happens, the text curves are generated flat on the ground, so both normal and tangent vectors lay on the xy plane. Consequently, the perpendicular direction to them both points either up or down. We have replaced the extrude node functionality, and more importantly, because we're dealing with a curve, we can resample and generate as many subdivisions as we need. Cool, right?
but we don't necessarily need to use this y offset value to define the extrusion direction. This is a global control for the text as a block. We need to control the extrusion separately for each letter. So let me zero it out and show you another way. Separate control means manipulating each character geometry on its own. But at the moment we're dealing with instances. So let's realize them right now. What we see in the 3D view is a mesh collapsed over the text outlines. But don't fret, all the subdivisions are still there and we'll get back to an extruded text. A very important property of every curve that Blender exposes to us is the factor value. It returns the length of the spline in a normalized 0 to 1 range. That means that its value increases from 0 towards 1 the further we travel along the spline. We will use this info to precisely position the points of our mesh. We'll store the factor field as a named attribute into every point of our profile curve before the conversion to mesh. That way, every point in the grid will have reference to it and act based on its value. Append a set position node. Now, feed the stored factor field into the Z input and watch the text thicken again. See? I told you we'll get the extrusion back. The only purpose of the curve to mesh node right now is to generate the grid. We're then taking control of the points and manipulate them ourselves. Use a map range to fit the 0 to 1 factor value to anything you need your extrude thickness to be. We'll animate this value later, but first let's set up other transformation types as well. Frame these nodes and call them extrusion. Let's take care of rotation next. Your first instinct might be to rotate the instances before the realized state. After all, every instance has a separate transform, right? Insert a Rotate Instance node and connect the Pivot Point from the String to Curves node. Change the Pivot Point to Midpoint. Leave the Local Space toggle on. Slide the Z value and observe each instance rotate from its center point. Cool, right? But that is where we hit a wall. Try rotating around the Y or X axis. You can clearly see the setup break. The letters rotate fine, but the extrusion geometry does not. And it has nothing to do with our modifications. Let me prove it to you. Add a view node after the curve to mesh step and set the Y and value of the profile curve back to 1. We're back at the beginning before our modifications. Try rotating now. Everything goes perfectly when we rotate the instances in the Z axis but it gets even worse for the other directions. Let me explain why this happens. Right now we are not rotating instances, but the curves themselves. Remember, we realized them. When we rotate the curves, their point positions change and so do the normal and tangent directions. Those attributes are trivial to the curve to mesh node. It's like trying to draw while moving the table. Mute the Realize node and see that instantly the problem goes away. Remind me why did we realize them in first place? As I said, we need separate control for each letter. You might argue that we can control each instance rotation, scale and position separately. What other controls are there? Well, you're right for the most part, but we can't animate those transformations propagating through the extrusions in waves so the realization has to happen. We just need to find another way to transform the letters. Reset the y-axis value on the curve line and delete the rotation instance node. The rotation has to happen after the mesh is generated, after the extrusion. Make some space, insert a vector rotate node, playing with the values you can see the text rotate all right. The only problem is that it does so as a block not each letter separately. We can fix that by getting the pivot point vector for each letter, storing it as an attribute for each point, 
and use it for our rotation. Let's do it. Store a vector attribute on the instance domain, call it pivot, and connect the pivot point field into it. This way the attribute will get inherited to all the points generated from these instances. What do we do with this info? How do we make the rotation aware of this vector? There's no pivot input in the rotate vector node. Well, there's another node that does that. It's called vector rotate. It is an older version of this one. It does have the pivot input, but we'll not use that. The reason is that we'll need the same pivot point for scaling the mesh also. And believe me, there's no pivot point input on that node. I've checked. So we'll work around that by applying a method widely used in the industry. We'll center the instances so their local pivot matches the world coordinate center, do the rotation around the world center, and then restore the position back. Sounds a mouthful, I know, but bear with me. Go back to the instances and store the current position as a named attribute. We'll use this one to restore the points back in their place after the rotation and scale have taken place. Call this one Initial Position. Now we're safe to center the instances at the world origin. Set Position and connect the pivot named attribute to it. Scale that vector by negative 1 and watch the characters jump to the center. How does this magic happen? The pivot point is a vector that describes the way from the instance local position, that is the 0, 0, 0 coordinate for each ladder, to its center in this case. Remember, you can have different point as pivots. Scaling this vector by negative 1 reverses that vector, so it now describes the way from the pivot point to the local position coordinate center. Hope this makes sense. Keep watching and it will, I promise. Sometimes you understand something when you see it in action. Now we can safely rotate the letters after the curve to mesh state. Play with the sliders and check that all axes work as they should. How do we restore the letters back to their place after the rotation? Append another add vector node and connect the initial position vector field to it. On top of that, Add the pivot vector field to it. Like magic, the character letters jump back to their place. Try rotating them now. See, they rotate from their local centers on all axes, as they should. Frame these nodes and rename them Rotate and Restore Position. We'll add more to them, but it's a good habit to be organized. Let's now set up the scaling part. We need to think carefully about the order of operations. We can't have scale affect the extrusion height as well, so it has to be calculated before the extrusion has taken place. Get the position node and insert a vector scale node after it. Drag the slider and proudly watch the letters scale from their local center. Frame these nodes and name them. There's still another transform we need. Remember the wavy up and down movement? That will take place after the rotation. Insert another add vector and leave it at that for the moment. Try it in action. We'll animate this value using time as an input. Frame the node and rename it movement. We've managed to create a general scaffold for any type of 3D animated text in Blender, able to move, rotate and scale the letters separately. You could add much more to this, but it's the core idea. Before moving on to the customization part, let's add the front face to each letter. We can't just use the fill curve on the instances, that would break the curve to mesh function. Instead, branch it out of the set position node, choose Ngons and Realize Instances again. To have the front face deform with the rest of the geometry and behave correctly, store the same factor attribute, 
but this time set a global value of 1 for all the points. This will ensure that this geometry deforms exactly as the row of polygons with a factor of 1 on the extruded faces. Join both geometries after the curve to mesh stage and enjoy the front faces of the letters. There's no need to generate the back faces in our case. We're scaling the back edges to zero anyway. Let's do it next. This will be the final step in our chain of transformations. Append a multiply vector node and add a combined vector to the free socket. To have this operation gradually affect the bottom faces more, connect the factor named attribute to the x and y axis and set the z value to 1. This tapers all the letters at the bottom. It's not a real depth but looks good from the top and creates a cute perspective effect. No matter what transformations we apply prior to this step, the geometry stays locked at the back. Frame these nodes and name the frame Taper. This completes the setup. Next stage is Animation. Our animation will use a sine wave driven by time and it will be offset by the factor value. It's easier than it sounds. Let's start with Scale. For my piece of animation I used a modular approach. I made a template and reused it with slightly different settings for rotation, movement and extrusion. Add a value node to the scale input, group it and name the group animation. Tab inside and replace the value node with a scene frame number. Feed it to a sine wave. We need to map our scene duration to a full circle so it loops perfectly. To make this setup update dynamically for any seed length, we'll add drivers to the input minimum and maximum values. Starting with minimum, in the driver panel, change the type of the variable to context property. The default context is active scene. Just type frame underscore start in the path field. Don't touch anything else. This reads our scene starting frame number and attaches its value to the minimum input. Now, do the same for the maximum input. Again, change the value to context property and type frame underscore and in the path field. We'll map our scene length to a full circle, that is 2pi or tau. Hit play and observe. There are two things we need to change. First, the animation is too slow. Let's add a multiplier to control how many loops we want. Temporarily add a random node to the empty socket. I only need this node so I can use one of its integer inputs to easily generate a group input of type integer using the input keyword. If I had created this input directly for the empty socket, which is of type float, the input would have been of the same type. I would have to change the input type in the group tab, but that would generate an extra input to the other group inputs present in the node group. Adding several inputs this way would clutter the node tree, that's why I took the extra step. The random node has served its purpose. Get rid of it. Rename the input to loops. Set the minimum to 0. Keep the default value to 1. Tab outside of the group, hit play and increase the loops count to speed the animation up. The second thing is the scale amount. The sign function returns a value from negative 1 to 1. We don't want a negative scale. So let's use map range to control the scale. Change the input from negative 1 to 1. We'll add separate group inputs for the min and max output range. Get outside of the group and set the minimum value to 0 0.5. 
At the moment all the letters shrink and grow at the same rate. Let's offset them in time. There are two types of offset we can apply, per character and along the extrude length. We have the spline factor attribute already set up. Let's use it. Copy it from our main node tree and paste it inside the animation group. We will add this factor to our time value as an offset per division line. Remember, we're working in radians here, so it's a good idea to convert our 0 to 1 factor range into an increment of a full circle. Multiplied by 60 degrees, or pi divided by 3, it's a good increment, not too small, not too large. And we'll also add a multiplier with a dedicated input to control the offset amount. Again, use the random node trick to generate an integer group input. Call the group row offset. Default value to 1, minimum 0, maximum 100. Tab outside and test it. Now you see the wave pattern appear. Increase the row offset and see the waves move along the extruded faces. Play with this value, but I think that 2 is a good compromise. How do we offset the animation per character? For that we need another factor, this time based on the character's number. Go back to the string to curves node and store one more attribute per instance. Call it character factor. To have the characters fit into a proper factor range from 0 to 1, divide their index number by the total curves instances minus 1. We'll now add this value to the time loop inside our animation node group. Same as earlier, multiplied by pi divided by 3, and also add another multiplier with an external control. Don't forget to use the random trick again. Delete it as soon as you've generated the group input. Call this input character offset. Set default value to 1, minimum to 0, and maximum to 100. Test the scene again. Play with the character offset value until you see something that you like. I'm using a value of 4. We're almost done. Now let's reuse the animation node group to drive the other transformations as well. Copy and paste it to continue with rotation. Change the minimum and maximum values to negative pi divided by 3 and pi divided by 3. Feed the result into the z-axis of a combined vector node and connect it to the rotation input socket. To break the harmony with the scale animation and have the motion appear more organic, decrease the loop count to 2, the row offset to 1, and raise the character offset to 6. These numbers seem ok to me, but play with them as you see fit. You can see now where we had it with this. It's a fully procedural method of animation and very efficient. Duplicate the node group again and use it for the up and down movement. I used these numbers, two loops, minimum negative 0.25, maximum 0.25, row offset to 4 and character offset to 4 also. And finally, I duplicated the animation node group again to animate the maximum extrusion value. My settings are as follows. Loops 2, minimum 2, maximum 4, row offset 0, character offset 2. You might ask how I ended up with these numbers. Experimentation for the most part. I also kept an eye open so the characters wouldn't intersect as they move through space. 
As the text on the screen suggests, this is a motion design experiment, so I'm going to leave the focus of this video to just the animation part. You can push it further by setting up materials and rendering beautiful frames out of it. I believe Blender to be an excellent tool for motion graphics and encourage you to use it more in that field. This is just an example of what you can do with text in it. There is more than one way to skin a cat, so if you have any suggestions on how to do the same with fewer steps, feel free to leave a comment. I did four pieces as I was developing this technique. The possibilities are plenty. I'm eager to see what you might come up with. Usually I do shorter videos, but this one had many concepts to explain, so I couldn't help making it longer. If you've followed me until now, I hope it was worth your time, and as always, if you like the video, please share the knowledge.